Welcome to Suffolk Library's pre-recorded event as part of our online book festival. We are so grateful to be able to offer these online events with utterly amazing authors, especially for those of you that don't always find it easy to attend our in-person library events and activities. I'm your host, Lisa, and today I am so privileged to introduce the extraordinary man and brilliant author, Jack Carr. Welcome, Jack. Thank you so much for having me. I love doing events like this. And anytime I get to talk about books and reading, uh, I get very excited. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's awesome that you can be here. And it's a good day when you've got books and reading, isn't it? Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. Well, yeah, I'm surrounded by books constantly and have been for my entire life because my mom was a librarian. So I got this love of reading from a, a very early age that's uh, never stopped. And I have all those books that I collected growing up. Like I've never gotten rid of one. So we have books everywhere. And I look, I'm looking out here right now because the, the uh, this wall in front of me is, is is full of books that go three back three deep on the shelves. And then in the other room, they're in stacks because we're in a, a, a rental right now as we look for a more permanent place. And uh, there's just stacks and stacks of books that I'm always going out and grabbing something because I remember a paragraph or a chapter and something that I need to re reference for research or whatever it might be. So we're surrounded by books constantly. It's absolutely awesome. I mean, we were talking before we started, me and Jack, we're both obviously librarian. I've got to love books as well. Um, but Jack, you know, he's an author, obviously. He's going to love, love books. But he's also a former Navy SEAL, which is extraordinary. And both, Jack, you decided at an extra, like just amazing young age that you were like, this is what I want to do with my life. Could you tell us about that and why you were so certain? Yeah, that's right. So at age seven, I decided I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And I think a lot, of, I, I, even before that, I knew I was going to go in the military. And I have distinct memories of being age four, age five, age six, and uh, watching old World War II movies with my dad and that sort of a thing. And uh, my grandfather was killed in World War II. He was a Corsair pilot, uh, which for those who, who know planes, it was the plane with the gull wings that went down like this that would fold up so they could fit on aircraft carriers. And uh, there was a show, TV show, in the late 70s, early 80s called Black Sheep Squadron, starring Robert Conrad, where he played Pappy Boynton, who is a, uh, uh, a Corsair pilot. And uh, it was a great show. I think I got a lot of my uh, leadership lessons from that show, because those guys, they were always drinking and fighting, and they, were, and they had this reputation of being, that's why they were called the Black Sheep. Um, they had this reputation of just being, uh, you know, not really the spit and polish Marine Corps pilots that we, that we think of, and yet they had this amazing track record of success in the Pacific against the, uh, the, the Japanese, and uh, so I just knew that I was going to go into the military at a very young age, and I uh, grew up surrounded by my grandfather's medals and his uh, pictures of him with his plane and his squadron and uh, these silk maps that they used to give aviators back then. Uh, and they gave silk maps because if you hit the water with a paper map, it would disintegrate, but a silk map just would get wet. Um, so I had all those all those mementos, and that was really my only connection to him, to World War II, to anyone in the military. Uh, so I just knew that was that was my path from a very early age. And then at age seven, I found out what SEALs were. And I was like, okay, these are my guys. These are my, these are my people. And uh, of course, my mom took every opportunity to take us to the library and do research. So when I told her I wanted to ask her about what frogmen were, what was a seal, and she took me down to the library and we started doing research. But there was hardly anything written in the early 80s about seals. There was a few things here and there, but not certainly not what there is today. And uh, you could read it in, I don't know, an hour or two, maybe. There was a, a chapter here, a chapter there, maybe a book or two, a couple magazine articles, a couple uh, references in newspapers. But most of them referenced the Vietnam War, which is uh, really a watershed moment in special operations history uh, where the SEALs uh, played a, had, had a lot of successes in the Mekong Delta. And so I studied all that. But once you finished studying that, there was no, you couldn't just go on the internet again and scroll and find another article, um, you were pretty much done at that point in like 1981, 82, 83, 84, that sort of a time frame. And uh, so I started reading the thrillers, the same kind of thrillers my parents were reading. Um, not at age seven, but about fifth grade, I started to, to read what they were reading. And uh, a lot of the authors that were writing back then had and continue today, um, had protagonists that had backgrounds I wanted in real life one day. So uh, when you're reading Tom Clancy or Nelson DeMille or AJ Quinnell or JC Pollock or Mark Olden, like all these guys had 
either Marine snipers or mm -hmm. uh, Navy SEALs or Army Special Forces or CIA paramilitary. And in that time frame, they all had Vietnam experience. And that's kind of how that was kind of a very uh, common background to give some uh, uh, legitimacy to what those characters were going to do in the novels to give them that kind of a foundation. Mm -hmm. So I just loved reading those those novels. And uh, at fifth grade, sixth grade, that's when I decided that, okay, after the military, then I'll write thrillers the same kind that I'm enjoying right now, back in 85 and 86 and 87. Um, and I've just never, never stopped reading and always been a fan of the genre. And and then also, sorry, it's kind of a long-winded answer, but my mom introduced me to uh, uh, Joseph Campbell uh, through a series of interviews he did with Bill Moyers in 1988 called The Power of Myth. And they turned that series on PBS into, a, I think it was a three-part um, uh, book afterward, but uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces, of course, is his seminal work, and so I was introduced to him very early on in the hero's journey, and then I started applying that to everything that I read or watched on television or movies ever since, not because in the future I thought this will be helpful, but just it was just very natural. So um, what was really happening back then is I was giving myself an early education in the art of storytelling from Masters of the Craft, although I didn't look at it like that at the time, I was just a fan. Um, and but it really gave me a foundation uh, from which to do what I'm doing now, which is writing thrillers. And it's yeah, very extraordinary to me that both those careers, most people never do. And you did both. Um, well, do you see yourself, Jack, as like this incredibly focused and determined person or along the route of this journey of your life? Has it just felt a bit like you just touched upon just the natural transition of what you should be doing next? Yeah, it's very natural, I think, because I wanted to do it so early in life. So and I never uh, wavered from wanting to do these two things. So I think when you want to do something so early, you don't yet know that uh, how hard it is and you don't have as many influences kind of telling you how hard life is or uh, how difficult it is to do something or the odds are stacked against you. I mean, they do tell you that later on. But if you've wanted to do something from such an early age, it doesn't really register. It's kind of like, well, yeah, that's why it's one of the reasons that I'm going to do it. But guess what? People have done it and I can do it too. And then you don't waste the, any bandwidth worried about how hard it is, thinking about the odds, coming up with backup plans or just kind of doing it on the side or no, it's your sole focus. So you know how hard it is with about this much bandwidth over here. And then you push that aside. Then all your bandwidth is focused uh, for the military side on training for bud, for buds, which is what we call SEAL training, basic underwater demolition SEAL training. Um, so you're running, you're climbing ropes, you're doing push-ups, you're swimming, you're doing all those things and you're studying warfare and you're doing all these things that you think are gonna help you get through this training and then be a good operator in the SEAL teams. Um, same thing with writing, uh, it's, it's all in. So you're all in on the military side of the house. And then when I transitioned, it was all in on the writing side of the house. And I also think it's very helpful not to have just woken up one day and decided, oh, uh, what, sh what should I do after high school? What should I do after college? I'll be a SEAL. Or what should I do after my time in the SEAL teams? Oh, maybe I should write. Uh, who's been writing in this genre for the last you know, 40 years? Let me go back and, and start. It was so great to be able to read those books like when they came out because there was nothing in my, there weren't these like built up, I don't know, biases or filters or you know anything. It was just pure enjoyment and love of reading and love of the story without anything that was going to kind of, you know, shade that or take up uh, space in my head as I was reading, or it was just, I was just enjoying this story um, from these guys that I was reading back then. And that's kind of part, that's that magic part. So when people ask about like the art and the science of something, it's, uh, it's really that, that heart that makes a good book and uh, a good story, good novel, good thriller. And you can't quantify what that is. I mean, people can say, you know, three parts, prologue, epilogue, have this, have the story arc. And you know what, you know, there are, yes, you can do that and have a horrible book because it's missing that heart. Um, so that's the intangible that, uh, that every great story needs. And you can't really put your finger on what that is. You just know it when you read it and then you know it when you write it. Um, so, uh, and that's just, yeah, I just stayed focused. So, so that was a long way once again to answer your question of, uh, of if, I, if, if I was uh, solely focused on all these things. And yes, I was, but, uh, but I knew that you have to put in the work for both of them. Mm -hmm. You have to put in that foundation to be a SEAL. You have to put in that foundation to be an author. Luckily, I got to do both those things very early. So the foundations were very strong. Um, it wasn't just like, hey, wake up and have a weak foundation because I went back and read 
like two books uh, and said, okay, yeah. I'm gonna write my own. Or I didn't do like go for one run and say, oh, I can be a SEAL. No, it's like this foundation that is very solid upon which to build going forward. And then I also didn't realize how, m- I thought of them as two distinctly different things as I was growing up, but I didn't realize how much one would inform the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, cause I never really looked at it like that, but having that background in the SEAL teams, particularly the experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, I can then go back and think, oh, I don't have to go and say, I don't have to sit down with someone or search someone out who was a, a sniper in Ramadi in 2006. I can say, uh, and then talk to that person and then ask them my questions, write down my answers, and then uh, through whatever filters I already have in place and then apply that to a fictional narrative. It's totally pure. I can just go back in my head and think about what it was like there and you know, what the smells were like, what we, what we used, what the enemy was using, like all that sort of thing. And then I can apply that to a completely fictional narrative. So when someone's reading it, it feels like it's real because the feelings come from a real place, although the story is totally fictional. So I didn't realize how much that earlier background in the military would help and that background in reading because I was just a fan, but both being a fan of the genre and having the experiences downrange and then also being a student of warfare my entire life and studying insurgencies and counterinsurgencies and terrorism, terrorist groups, and just being able to, not just starting that research for a book and then writing it, but having this background that really goes back to my earliest memories. uh, And I can apply all of that to the stories now. So uh, all of me goes into them. It's uh, it's a very personal writing experience when I sit down to, to write a novel. I think well, all the, what you just said, Jack, was brilliant. And a lot of authors I talk to actually have to do a lot of research. But as you just said, you're in this unique position where you've gone through a lot of these similar kind of experiences yourself. And I loved what you said about bandwidth as well. And also, you know, you don't wake up one morning and be a success at something. It takes time dedication and work and then you can then go on and it's you know you've been Navy SEAL you're now the successful author and um, there's a quote actually from Lee Charles about your book that I absolutely love which is this is seriously good the suspense is unrelenting unrelenting it really is and the tradecraft is so authentic that the government will probably ban it so read it while you can and I think Jack you do actually submit your books to the Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review at the Department of Defense, which, before you release them, which is amazingly, you know, different to a lot of what authors do. What's that all like for you as an author? Yeah, that's kind of a big pain. Um, We actually had to delay the publication of the second novel because they took so long to get back. And what they're supposed to do is get back to you in 30 days. Uh, They have never made their 30-day window. Um, They took over- Seven months was the longest, wasn't it? Yep, exactly. Seven months for um, for the second novel for True Believer. And so we had to push it from its spring release to later in the summer. Um, and that's just how it how it went. But uh, yeah, I did it just wanted to be safe because I was so close to uh, the things that uh, that I kind of w- was writing about. Um, for this last one, though, I didn't. So that's the, the devil's hand. And that's because there was nothing, there was no, there were, I had to do a lot of research for that one uh, because I had no touch points with bioweapons or uh, biomedical research or anything like that in my life or in the military. So that was all research. And I figure, okay, I'm far enough past this. And, uh, and also for my last one for Savage Sun for the third book, I, I submitted it. They were, I mean, right up to the deadline. Getting it was like six and a half months or something. We almost had to push that date. The publisher was like just pulling, they're pulling their hair out, um, and we got it back just in time. Like it couldn't have been any closer. And uh, and so what I did it was had my lawyers go through like what I, they did with the second one and tie every single redaction to a publicly available government document. So not something that you find on Wikipedia or you know in, in some someone else's book or anything like that but publicly available from the government on a website. So they tied each and every one of those. And we did that with True Believer. And I won 37 of the 54, even though all 54 redactions were tied to a publicly available government document. They only let me win on 37. So then when we published the paperback, then we took those out. So people can see, they can compare the paperback and the hardcover and see what the government was concerned about and what which which uh, redactions I won on the appeal. So I did that for the third book, Savage Sun, and we appealed, did the same thing, all the work, figuring out where those publicly available government documents were, tying them to each and every redaction. And then the government came back and said, we're not gonna let you um, uh, appeal. 
And we're like, well, it says right here that you can appeal. You have this amount of time. We're well within the window. And, and I thought that was their way of telling me, stop wasting our time with this fiction stuff. We have actual nonfiction stuff we need to review. So that's kind of what I'm going with. And, you know, that's just how it, how it goes. But it's, it's definitely your books are the first I've read with redacted parts in it. It does actually add something to it to make it even more realistic. And when you said then about Devil's Hand, which is the one that was released in April, what was it like coming at it from a different perspective where you're like, actually, I've not experienced these things. I need to go and talk to people. Did you enjoy that? I did, but COVID hit. And so now I'm in the house with my wife, with our children, with the dog. And for anyone who's worked at home with children, uh, know that when you close the doors to your office, it becomes like a magnet for everyone to come to your door. Um, so you're trying to do this research, you're trying to set up interviews with people who have uh, had experience with biomedical research. Um, so, so it was a lot of work, especially because <laughs> of constant interruptions during that time frame. But it was interesting in that I outlined it in August of 2019. And that's when I was, I went over to, to Russia to do research for Savage Sun. And I didn't bring my computer. I didn't bring my phone because who knows with my background, what people have sent me an email over the years. And I didn't want to walk into Russia and have all of my information like sucked out from, you know, of a computer or have them take me into a back room and take my computer away and download everything. Like who knows what's in there. So, uh, so I didn't, and I've just brought a sat phone to stay in touch with my family. And I brought a notebook to, to make my notes. And so on the flight to and from, I, uh, I outlined the entire, the entire book of uh, The Devil's Hand. And uh, that was August of 2019. And really the foundation of that book is all about uh, what the enemies learned by watching us on the field of battle for the last 20 years. That's how I started it. Because essentially uh, we have been, we've been these, in Iraq, been in Afghanistan, been in Syria, other places around the world. And Russia, China, North Korea, um, uh, Iran, super empowered individuals, terrorist organizations, they've been able to watch us over these last 20 years, essentially watching us play poker and take notes on how we're playing our cards and then apply those to future battle plans. And then I went back even further and I said, okay, let's go back to 1979. What would somebody who was very young back then and is now a senior, let's say military leader in Iran, um, what would lessons would they have taken from 79 up to 2001 and then 2001 forward? And how would they be applying that to their, their battle plans? And so that was the foundation. And then I used uh, the catalyst of a bioweapon to move the plot forward. Uh, so I started doing research into that. Uh, and then COVID hits. And I start hearing about it in December of 2019 because I'm so deep into this biomedical research and I start hearing about something in China. And I was like, oh, okay, because we've heard of things coming out of China before, um, but uh, there, there was something a little different about it, but I thought that it was just because I was so deep into that research. And then January hits and we start hearing more about it. Late January hits, pretty much we're all aware of it at this point. And then February hits and of course the whole, the whole world knows about it. But because I was in the enemy's shoes and I had been in the enemy's shoes since August of 2019, I thought, well, what is what are our enemies learning? If I was the enemy, which I am because I'm standing in their shoes right now, looking at things through that lens, what would I take from our response to COVID? And then in the United States, of course, we have a summer of civil unrest. Um, and I thought, well, what is the enemy learning from that? And then we have a very contentious uh, political season, a season, an election cycle. Um, what are they learning from that? They're not just looking at these things with a passing interest in going about their business. No, they're drawing specific lessons. So as I'm writing and as I'm doing this research, like these things are all uh, getting woven into the storyline because the enemy is learning from them. Uh, so it became a lot more timely than I thought when I first outlined it in August of 2019. Um, and then as far as the research goes, yeah, books, medical journals, uh, then for me, kind of translating that medical speak, it, either by talking to somebody or doing more research on what this sentence actually says and what this means, because I don't speak that medical language. Um, and then what's interesting about bioweapons and the biomedical research is that people are very guarded about um, what they've done in that space, and, but they wanna talk about it. So they tell you a little bit and they, they hold things back. So what you do is talk to five people, talk to six people, and what each one holds back is a little something different. So you get to put this puzzle together and then you confirm and then you, and then you, uh, you read these books and biomedical journals and stuff like that and you weave together this story, but it's really a puzzle. 
that you're putting together because there are so many things that people leave out when they talk to you and then certain things that articles or books or journals or whatever else leave out as well so you have to really do your research like a journalist uh, when you're doing something like this and so by the time I was done I thought that it's pretty close to what we what our response to something like this would actually would actually be so uh, and I've had people reach out since that said uh, how did you get this even people that I interviewed were like hey I didn't tell you this stuff how did you do this and uh because they're like you're scary close uh and you know it's just talking to a lot of people and then also thinking about what I would do or what a country would do and uh just piecing it all together so it was, it was fascinating to do but it was a lot more work than I anticipated at the outset uh so I'm still exhausted from it I think oh bless you I really <laughs> love how your mind works Jack like all these different perspectives that you're considering of how things have been interpreted and I did notice that you have like your you had your August reads and one of the books was Michael Gladwell and um I, which I think it was talking to strangers mm -hmm. and I really like his books for similar reason. Okay. Things like Blink is fascinating of how the mind works. Is that kind of like first for knowledge? You know, it's not just military, it's everything. Is that the case? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I've been reading Malcolm Gladwell since I first uh, became aware of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, his podcast is incredible. If you haven't listened to that, I think they're on season seven maybe now eight but anyway it's incredible every single one of those is amazing it's a story and a book even in and of itself um but yeah malcolm gladwell is absolutely incredible and specifically talking to strangers i thought was timely um because i do have these reading lists that come out because i get that question quite often hey what, what what do you recommend and so usually i choose six books a month uh not that you're supposed to read all these six books a month because i've read them over my entire lifetime but they're just selections and i write a little bit about each one and maybe one resonates with somebody or two or you know who knows but uh but there's some options and so i just i it's this next one coming out in september i think comes out next week or the week after um yeah. are all books on afghanistan because there's so many obviously our focus is uh, there how why we stayed there for so long how why we got out the way we did and uh, i i chose a lot more than six books they're actually over here right now because i was just taking pictures of them for the website so it's like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen like 16 books oh, um, wow. that, uh, that people, if they want to have a, a, a good base if, uh, in order to evaluate the last 20 years in Afghanistan and why we, we, why we left the way we did and what we need to do going, going forward um, uh, to take these lessons and apply them to the future as wisdom, hopefully, so that um, you know, future, future generations don't have to learn these same lessons really mm -hmm. in blood. Um, so I have a bunch. So anyway, those are going out. But uh, so those, there's a couple in there that are, that are I mean, they're, there's they're all afghanistan based really and then some just general warfare based ones to give you uh, a better lens through which to, to look at afghanistan in particular but uh but yeah malcolm gladwell's uh because that was august and that that one came out in early august that reading list but talking to strangers is just so valuable because he talks about all those kind of those, those jumping to jumping to conclusions and making uh, uh assumptions based on you know your previous biases or misunderstandings mostly it's misunderstandings um and not reading people correctly and how it just then snowballs into something that it didn't need to be if we could just kind of you know sit down and have a coffee together yeah, definitely. It's something I personally find really, I find really interesting because I study psychology because of it, because people are fascinating and you know, society and you say how it all works. It's, it's kind of a rabbit hole that's a joy to go down because you learn so much. I'm going to scoot into your your first book in the um, recent series, The Terminal List, which is awesome. And rather excitingly, at the moment, being filmed for a TV series. Now, as the author, what's that like? Yeah, no, it's a because I once again, from wanting to do this from such an early age, it was just one of those things I thought would happen. It's like, okay, you write a novel, it makes New York Times list, it gets optioned by an A-list star and director and, and all that. And uh, it's been an amazing process and you from what i understand for the most part usually they like to get rid of the author right away so that you're not on set going you ruined my vision um and which which is most of the time the case but uh for me it was a little different because both antoine fuqua the director who's incredible and uh and chris pratt the star who optioned it right out of the gate um uh, they both want to be involved they wanted to keep that that awesome. gritty dark realistic authenticity um to it and they knew that from uh, that Hollywood was going to want to Hollywood it up a little bit and lose lose a lot of that. So it's been very, very interesting to, uh, to keep that because you're telling a story through a visual medium. And I understood from the very beginning that 
the story is going to change because you're not telling it on a page, you're telling it visually. Um, and then you have all these people involved now. So there's like 350 people just on set to make this make this happen. And then you have executives at Amazon Prime. So the scripts go up, the edits go up when, once you finish an episode, and then it goes all the way up to the top, and then it comes down with their notes. So there are so many people. And one of my takeaways from this whole experience is that how shocked I am that one, anything gets made in Hollywood, and two, anything good gets made because there are so many opportunities to ruin something. Um, so now when I watch anything, I am so much more forgiving when I see a mistake or uh, or if it's, hey, this part wasn't the greatest, hey, you know what? That's okay. Like they made this thing incredible. And uh, there are a lot more opportunities to mess something up than there are to, to tweak it to make it good, if that makes sense. Um, so, so my experience, they, they wanted me involved from the get go. So I got to really work on that first script with uh, what they call a showrunner, who's kind of like uh, a director for a feature film. A showrunner is managing all these parts for a series. And uh, so we got to work on that first script together. Then Antoine and Chris took it around and shopped it to HBO and Showtime and Amazon and Netflix and Hulu and all those things. And then they got, I guess they got a bidding war with Amazon and Netflix and, and uh, Amazon ended up with it. Uh, and then we started filming uh, March and just finished uh, about a week and a half ago. So now it's into the editing phase and I get all oh, that. Oh, wow. so it's all, it's all it's, been finished filming. It's done. Yes, breaking news. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's done. And and uh, and now we're just going through each episode and doing these like these like time stamps. And I click my computer and be like, hey, this is, uh, you, you got to change this or this line didn't sound right. Can we do a voiceover thing or, you know, whatever it is. And so they get my notes and then they've been very receptive to, to most all of them thus far. Um, and yeah, it should come out sometime in, in 2022, but the, but the craziest part of how it came about is that as I was writing, I thought of Chris Pratt playing the role and oh this goodness. is like, let's say early 2015. So he hadn't done Guardians of the Galaxy, hadn't done, um, uh, Jurassic World, hadn't done Avengers, that sort of a thing. So he was just this guy on, uh, on, uh, Parks and Rec. And uh, this funny guy in Parks and Rec, and he had a very small role in Zero Dark Thirty as a SEAL where he got in shape and, mm -hmm. and uh, had this very small role there. And for whatever reason, I was, I thought, hey, Chris Pratt's my guy. Chris Pratt can bring this to life. And I thought that because uh, being a student of not just, you know, just novels and thrillers, but of, uh, of film and TV and just growing up in that in the 80s and seeing all those those all these movies and knowing what I liked, what I didn't, reading books and then seeing how they were adapted, which ones worked for me as a, as a viewer and which ones didn't. Um, but I thought, hey, who's that actor that needs to take a risk? Because I'm taking a risk with my family going all in on writing. Who's that actor that needs to take a risk? And I thought, you know, Chris Pratt, he can do it. Because um, I thought of Tom Hanks in the 80s playing all these just in all these comedies. And then all of a sudden in the early 90s, he takes a risk with Philadelphia. And then from then on, he can do whatever he wants. Pretty much anything he wants. Exactly. And so I thought, who's the who's that actor that needs to do that, to take that risk? And also, I need someone likable. I need someone that the viewer already likes because he's going to be very dark and very violent. And he's going to do things that uh, maybe if he was an unlikable person that you wouldn't want to go along on that journey. So I need someone who can uh, who needs to take a risk, who needs to show viewers that he can do something that's other than uh, the comedy type role or kind of a campy type role and flip that switch and and get it done. And that was Chris Pratt. And then before my first book came out, a friend called me out of the blue who I hadn't talked to in about five years. And he said, hey, I always wanted to thank you for something you did for me in the SEAL teams. And I couldn't remember what it was, but he said, hey, you sat me down in your office. You talked to me about transitioning out of the military uh, as, as he was getting out. And you introduced me to people in the private sector and nobody else in the SEAL teams took the time to do that. Nobody else cared to sit down with me like that. And he said, I've never forgotten it. I always wanted to thank you. And I said, no problem. How's it going? And he said, well, I heard you have a book coming out. And I said, yep, I have it coming out in about four or five months. And I have these galley copies, which are like rough drafts that I can send you. And he said, yeah, I'd like that, but I'd like to give it to a friend of mine. And I said, who's that? And he said, Chris Pratt. Oh, like, that's oh, awesome. Interesting, because I thought of Chris playing this role. So he, he read it and just to make sure it wasn't horrible. Uh, and he loved it. Then he gave it to Chris. Chris read it in late December of 2017 and then called the next week, the first week in 2018 and optioned it for a film. So I got, uh, yeah, it's really extremely fortunate. And uh, and I like it. I've seen all, uh, it's eight episodes. I've seen seven thus far that we're working on. The eighth one should come in the next week or so. And uh, yeah, I think it's looking pretty good. 
absolutely awesome i'm a big fan of chris pratt i think he's going to be phenomenal and the, some of the pictures on set he's had a rough time hasn't he yeah. um oh, yeah. being in the series uh-huh oh, he's meeting. yeah <laughs> he's going to take a nice long break between this and his next project <laughs> yeah a bit of r and r um but right. very much and as jack just said coming out next year which should just be awesome amazon Mm -hmm. remember and obviously your latest paperback publication that's that it i love those covers too yeah i love those you, international covers fantastic right. um third installment in the series and i think a book you always wanted to write since sixth grade and mm -hmm. you were able to put off writing it until you'd established your james reese character can you tell us about that that's right so when i first started i wrote down six, seven, eight different ideas, like one page executive summaries. And that's kind of how, that's how I start all the books thus far anyway. Uh, I write like a one page executive summary, which is like an expanded uh, jacket description. Um, and then I take that and turn that into an outline. And then I take that outline and turn that into the book. So that's been the process for all of them so far. But for the first one, I wasn't exactly sure what the storyline was going to be, which one I was going to start with. So I wrote those six, seven, eight, nine different one page executive summaries and some are two paragraphs some are one some were four you know but fit on a page pretty much and put those all on the table and looked at all of them and the one i wanted to start with was savage sun and that's because i read the most dangerous game back in sixth grade which was a 1924 short story by richard connell and back then i knew that i wanted to one day write a thriller that paid tribute to that short story back in sixth grade um and so that was in my head back then. And I wanted to start with that one, but I knew that the characters weren't developed enough to be able to tell that story the way I wanted to. So I knew I had to start somewhere else. And that was the terminal list. It was very clear to me. It wasn't like, ah, which one do I do? It was very clear. This is the one to start with the terminal list. I have to introduce James Reese, introduce why he is the way he is. Uh, and also I love, and I think readers do too, this theme of revenge and mm -hmm. this theme of revenge without constraint. And it seems like growing up, I love, I gravitated towards movies and books that had that theme because you get that resolution, even if there's a couple of things that, uh, that you leave out there for the next book and the next movie, you get enough resolution uh, in such a way that's so visceral that you couldn't do in real life. Um, and that, but someone can do it in a fictional sense. You can do it on the page, you can do it on a film and a TV series, uh, but you can't do it in real life, uh, no matter how much you've been wronged or how bad you feel. But when you see somebody else doing it, it gives you this resolution and makes you feel good about yourself. It's quite yeah, satisfying, yeah, isn't it's it? Very, that's it. That's what I'm trying to go for. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. It's satisfying. Um, so I so I knew that was the, the way to start. Um, but it's not just about that. It had to be more than just the story. And this is where that heart comes into it. Um, it's also really about somebody who becomes the terrorist, becomes the insurgent that he's been fighting at that time for the past 16 years. You know, now it would be you know 20 years if it was to be today. Um, but he becomes that terrorist. And I do that by showing how he hair gets longer, he grows the beard, he raids the the uh, uh, the armory of his now enemy, which uh, to get weapons. And then he brings the tactics and techniques uh, that have worked against us in Iraq and Afghanistan to home soil. Um, but even deeper than that, it's really a book about a veteran who brings the wars from Iraq and Afghanistan to the front doors of people who have been sending young men and women to their deaths now for now for 20 years from nice temperature controlled offices in Washington, D.C. So it's uh, so so that was the one to start with. And it was very therapeutic to write as well, um, because of because we see these senior level leaders who have made horrible decisions because they didn't understand history. They didn't bother to go back. They didn't even ha have to go back to, to Genghis Khan or they didn't have to go back to Alexander the Great. They could have gone back to three three British experiences in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So many lessons there. They could have gone back to the Soviet experience from 79 to 89. But for whatever reason, uh, this reason I call imperial hubris and this intellectual inertia of our senior level leaders, for some reason, they did not take the correct lessons if they did look back um, and apply them to the, the current situation. So uh, I got to, to write a book about it, essentially. And uh, it was very therapeutic for me to take some of these guys out in the way that my character does. Um, and then at the end of that, I also realized, hey, it's still not ready for Savage Son. Like, he's still not developed. He has to deal with what just happened in the last book. He can't just. And I thought it, I took a little risk with True Believer in that I didn't just pick him up and drop him right into a new a new adventure, a new a new conspiracy, a new whatever. Um, he had to learn to live again. 
And I really thought that my editor, Emily Bessler at Emily Bessler Books, I thought she was going to cut out the first third of that book um, because it's his journey uh, learning to live again, finding that next mission in life, uh, finding that next passion in life. What's that going to be? How is he going to use what he did in the last book and in the military in general? Um, How is he going to build off that foundation in a positive way um, after everything that just happened to him? So he needed to go on this journey. And I thought it would be disingenuous to just pick him up and drop him somewhere else. And now he's off on another adventure after what he just dealt with in the first book. Mm -hmm. So the second one, I really took a risk and it, and it, uh, I think it paid off um, because it's different than what many people would, would expect, especially coming off the success of the first book. Um, so anyway, he needs to, needs to learn to live again, needs, which a lot of people do, not just in the military, but any transition in life, whether that's uh, changing jobs or you know, a divorce or whatever it might be, you're going to have these things in life that are major transition points, and you're going to have to use what happened in the past, whether it was positive or negative, and channel it in a positive way going forward. And that's your choice as an individual, how you're going to deal with what happened to you in the past uh, or what you were part of in the past, but how are you going to figure that out and use that as a way to move forward in a positive in a positive manner. So, uh, so that's really what that second book is about, is him learning to live again. And he does. And then when I finished that one, I was like, okay, now it's time for Savage Son. Now it's the time to write the one that I've been wanting to write since I was in the sixth grade. And really, that's really, it's about the dark side of man, uh, hunter versus hunted through that dynamic. I get to explore these characters. And uh, and it was, it was fun to write. And I got to go to, to Kamchatka, Russia over there to really put my put boots on the ground, as I call it, to weave that local flavor in, uh, which I like to do uh, if I possibly can, because there's just so much you can't get from doing a Google search on a certain location so uh, I got to go over there and spend some spend some time talk to talk to the people same thing I did in in, in Africa for for sections of both Savage Sound and True Believer um, of course for the first book I'd already been to Iraq been to Afghanistan so I didn't really need to do didn't need to go back um, to do that uh, that research but um, but yeah it was a uh, it was so fun to write because I was finally getting to write that book that I wanted to write my whole life you already got it all in your mind and you you mentioned about the most dangerous guy in that book that you wanted to play you know to, to to draw upon in the savage sun what other books jack do you feel have had like a really profound impact on you and i think is it david morell's books might be included in that so oh, yeah. can you let us know Oh, for sure. First Blood, which has never been out of print since 1972, uh, which for those who have not read it, is very different than the Sylvester Stallone movie. Uh, quite a different ending, um, which, and it's really uh, a re, it's a refighting of the Vietnam War on U.S. soil, uh, which is interesting uh, with that dynamic with Colonel Sam Troutman as Uncle Sam. His first name is not Sam uh, by chance. He's Uncle Sam, that's the government. And then you have the old school sheriff, the new school long haired hippie uh, in Rambo all coming together, but it's, it's fascinating. So David Morrell, huge influence. And now we're friends and we talk about uh, almost weekly. Uh, he's just an amazing guy. Uh, Brotherhood of the Rose, of course, is, uh, is just, and that whole series, Brotherhood of the Rose, Fraternity of the Stone, League of Night and Fog, they're some of the best uh, espionage thrillers ever met, ever written. And what he did for those is take, um, you know, some of the most compelling elements of UK spy fiction. So uh, Jean Le Carré, of course, and then some of, at the time, uh, some of those compelling elements of US spy fiction, which would be like a Ludlum type thing. And he combined those elements to do something that was totally unique and moved the whole genre forward. So he's just incredible. But uh, Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer, it's historical fiction, um, but it follows two, two guys from before World War I up to Vietnam. Uh, and one is a staff officer and one gets is enlisted and gets a battlefield commission in World War I. And it follows their lives up to Vietnam. So that's, a, that's one that was a, a huge influence on me. Um, uh, Winds of War, Worn Remembrance by Herman Woke, once again, historical fiction, but incredible stories. Uh, and then on the thriller side of the house, the, the David Morrell, of course, uh, Nelson DeMille with the Charm School, uh, just amazing. I still remember reading that exactly where I was when I read that. Uh, Centrifuge by J.C. Pollock, incredible. Um, and Last of the Breed by Louis L'Amour. Uh, I just had all these books growing up that I loved reading and that uh, I think each of those ones that I mentioned uh, amongst a host of others all move the genre forward and that's always my goal uh, is to do that with each and every book and it doesn't have to be a huge leap but for me just moving it forward by degree hopefully by a little more than one degree but just moving it forward by a bit 
each time. So you don't stay stagnant. Uh, you're not just regurgitating things that have been done before and giving it a modern twist. Um, you're putting all these elements from personal experience and life, uh, all the things that I've read in the thriller genre, all the things that I've studied as far as warfare, terrorism, insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, and then things that are outside of that study, like the Malcolm Gladwell type things, like all that stuff comes together and is a part of you or part of each and every every one of us. And then I take all of that and I apply it to the story. Um, so that's why they're so personal. I think that's why they resonate with uh, with people or there have thus far anyway. So that's always the goal is to, to take all that, to pour myself into it and to move the genre forward uh, just by a little bit. Uh, it doesn't have to be huge, but we would move it forward somehow with each story. I think I feel like that's just you, Jack. You're always moving forward. You're always learning more. And, and your first for knowledge and understanding is just it's really inspiring. Um, genuinely, I I love that myself, obviously librarian. So, you know, it's why it's why I got into libraries. I think knowledge, oh, it, it sets you free. It gives you options. It allows you to understand the world we live in and well, a little bit better. And yeah. you said about moving it that little bit further. It makes me think your fifth installment. <laughs> That's right. Um, That's right. So, so working on that now. That's yeah, so working on that now. And uh, I thought we'd be in a place where I'd have my own office that was a little separate from the house. And, but once again, it's kind of the same uh, same situation we were in last year, uh, where we're all here packed in together. Um, but yeah, I try every time, I, every chance I get, I try to go to the library, get a get a room that they have these little study rooms that you can use for a couple hours at a time. Uh, so oftentimes I get uh, I get bumped for a high school kid working on a history project because I've been in there too long. Um, but I try to go to a place that's quiet. And for me, I don't need, like views i don't need uh anything like that i just need a quiet spot i mean i can be looking at a blank wall or i could be looking at a view of the ocean doesn't matter uh it's just that quiet place without interruption like that's the uh that's the key um and yeah so this uh this next one there's going to be some answers there's a couple of questions i left out there uh lingering to two big ones and um i'm not going to say if i answer both in this book but i'll say at least one gets answered in this uh this next book in the blood and uh we're moving the date around on that one a little bit. I know for international, it's moved around anyway, but uh, depending on when the series for Amazon drops, because you don't want to have, because uh, that one people might jump over and get the first book and you don't want to essentially be competing with yourself uh, with two books coming out at the same time. So we're kind of figuring out exactly when that's going to going to come out based on when Amazon wants to drop the series. So, so we shall see. But, uh, but this one, Luckily, I don't have to go and do crazy bioweapons research, biomedical research for like I did the last one, because that was that was quite stressful, especially being in the, the house with everybody for COVID. Uh, this one, I can go back to, to what I know, uh, go back, but I still confirm. Um, I don't just think, hey, I was a, a sniper, so I, I know I, mean, I know a little bit. I'm, I have a good foundation there, but I also need to confirm a lot and make sure that because uh, there's been some time now since I was in uh, a couple of years have gone by. So I go, I go back and I call up my friends and just confirm, hey, is this right? Does this sound right to you? Uh, so I, I, I still do confirm. So there is still research involved, but it's mostly confirmation type research rather than starting from scratch and trying to figure something out that I have zero background in. So this is uh, going to have some good sniper on sniper action and uh, super excited to get it out there. Awesome. As I said, it's in the blood and some point next year, as Jack said, depends on that Amazon show. It makes sense, doesn't it? They don't want, yeah. they want those that haven't yet discovered you. I'm just like trying to catch up at the same time. Yep. Um, finally, Jack, it's just been such a pleasure. What's one of the best, one of the things that you enjoy most about being an author now? Ooh, I guess that it's, it just feels so natural um, that, uh, that I've kind of I've grown into it through my whole, whole life, um, that put in this, this base of work and that it's resonating. So I guess I haven't really thought about that question before, but I guess I would say just off the top of my head that to have the work resonate with uh, with people. I think that's probably it, to have written something, not just to have done it, but to have poured so much into it uh, that it resonates. So it's not just, okay, check, I did it, nobody read it. Although that's the best way to write is to think about just writing it without worried about if anybody's gonna like it, if anybody's gonna read it, uh, is just to get it done. Like that's the, don't worry about marketing, don't worry about your website, don't worry about any of those sorts of things. Just make the book the best it can possibly 
B. Like that's that's the first the first part. Uh, then once you get to that part, then you know then it's time to put in a whole another kind of turn another page and, and figure out how to how to get it out there. But don't worry about getting it out there while you're writing it because um, it, this is your chance to make it the best that it can possibly be. So don't waste any bandwidth anywhere else. So I think the best part, once again, uh, of doing this being at this stage, having the show come out, working on the fifth novel, um, all those sorts of things is that uh, people want the next one. Uh, it's resonating. You get emails, people telling you, hey, I introduced my, uh, you know, my dad to this book or uh, someone on set coming up to me and saying, hey, my son's about to leave for, um, for boot camp uh, tomorrow. Would you mind signing a book for him? He's a huge fan. You know, those sorts of things um, are, are really, really cool. Um, and so I guess that would be it. I guess that, that to have put in the work and then that it's resonating and people want more. I think that's probably the most satisfying uh, part of it. And I feel extremely fortunate. And what's cool about today is I get to thank people because let's say 1985, you write a book and okay, uh, you do a few interviews here and there. Um, maybe there's a letter to the a letter editor here and there, a review somewhere. That's it. And then you're off writing your next book for maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years, two and a half years, you know, whatever it, it was, because series books didn't really, they weren't on a schedule unless you were Clive Cussler uh, back then, you know, it wasn't every year up until really the late 90s when that started to, to be the more of the norm. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that part is, is now I have these we have Instagram, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, I have a podcast. I have these ways that I can say thank you to everybody who has told a friend because the book, third book hit the New York Times list. Uh, and it was before I was on Joe Rogan's podcast with a big audience. It was before Chris Pratt said anything about the series. So what got it there is people telling a friend. Uh, and they did that through the modern way, which isn't just around a water cooler at work, which it would have been in 1985 or something. But doing it virtually, whether they have one follower or 30 million followers or anything in between, is that people risked that their time, their most valuable asset, um, they risked spending that with me in the pages of the book, which is why I take, because you're not going to get that time back. And so it's a, it's a huge responsibility to for me as an author to make sure that everything is the best it can possibly be because someone's taking your risk on me and they're, 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 they're using their most valuable asset, their time, um, and spending that time with my character in these pages, with me in these pages. But today I get to thank them. So I get to thank them on a podcast like this. I get to thank them on Instagram. So like late at night, when my wife's asleep, I'm like still going through and I'm hitting that little heart where I'm saying thank you so much because those people are the ones who got it on the list and who who made these novels a success uh, is because they risk they took that risk. And I want to thank, I try to thank everybody I can. It's getting harder and harder to thank everyone individually, but uh, but I really, that's the, that's the best part about doing this in 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, is that we have these means that where I can thank people for reading these books. So uh, yeah, thank you for, for reading them. And thank you for, for having me on. And thank you for, uh, for promoting reading and, and books and authors. It's uh, sincerely appreciated. And you're, I was just say, Jack, Jack, your passion and expertise totally comes across in the series. It's so brilliant. And I know what you mean about modern technology. You know, we we can connect to people. I mean, at the moment, I'm in Suffolk, Jack's in America. And here we are having this chat that's going to yeah. be broadcast in October for our book festival. And I you just think the world's extraordinary that we can do these things. <laughs> it is. It's amazing. Um, I'm just going to finish by thanking everyone for joining us um, for this pre-recorded event. Um, we're a charity. We're always so grateful for everyone's support. And Jack, it's been such a pleasure. You are an extraordinary person. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can do it again sometime.